Hello and welcome to the Tetration video series. My name is Rob, I'm here with Tim, and in this section we're going to talk to application workspaces. Now, Tim, in subsequent modules, we've spoken through some of the building blocks with Tetration and how we create an inventory and we build some structure around that with things like scopes. Mm -hmm. And in this module, we're actually going to step into how we start to um, build policy or what is the place in Tetration that we actually define policy, model the policy, analyze it and ultimately enforce that policy. Mm -hmm. So given the, the key building blocks of Tetration and the, the real anchor points for policy being the scopes, what we're going to look at is policy that's applied across different scopes in the hierarchy. Okay. And perhaps before we get into that and dig into further detail with the workspaces themselves, let's just take a look at the scope tree we've got for our sort of example environment here. And what makes sense in terms of placement of policies and how we might build that up. Okay. So this reflects the scope tree that we've created for our demo environment. Yep. Uh, you can see that we've uh, cut a little bit off the top of the tree just to keep it simple. And we're starting here from the cloud layer. So this is basically where our workloads have been selected yep. based on the attributes that they uh, have, which includes being part of our application workloads. So we've split down to applications and services with inside the cloud. And then under applications, we've got one application, or I should say uh, one group of applications called banking, mm -hmm. and a sub-application called core. And then under that, we have the lifecycle of prod. Okay. So obviously, in a larger real production scope tree, we would have a, a lot more different leaf nodes of this tree. We would have dev, testing underneath core. We would have multiple applications under banking. And clearly, we'd have more than just the banking application. But we've tried to keep it nice and simple. Yeah, so we've got a focal point just on this particular application and really looking at policies that are discovered and built around that application, but also the other key components and maybe other layers in which we can actually apply policy that apply there. So. In other modules, we've spoken to the policy lifecycle and um, also how we actually do policy discovery. Mm -hmm. If we've got an application, and let's just say we've got, let's just say there's 50 workloads that make up this core banking production application, what, what's the right place that we actually want to perform the application level of discovery for that? So for the application level discover, discovery of policies, policies that specifically relate to that application, yep. and in particular that production version of the application, the place that we want to create the workspace, associate the policies with, and ultimately run ADM yep. is via this prod part of the scope tree. Okay, so right here. Right down at the leaf of the, yep. the tree, right? Because that's ultimately the, the derivation of that application instance, the different components that make up the application. And again, the scope being the holding um, group for those 50 workloads. And we're still going to then do a further breakdown in terms of the actual tiers of that application or the subcomponents that make it up. Exactly. But it makes sense to keep those policies as close as possible to that scope and relating to that application only. Yep. But that can't be the only policies, right, for a data center. Mm -hmm. And that's why we might want to associate some policies elsewhere. And I see that on the screen here, we do have some more policies. So Exactly. Yeah. So let's maybe switch back to the screen here, because you can actually see that we do have um, a number of workspaces. And here, we're dealing with the part of the user interface that's termed applications. Now, the application um, page is where we find the list of overall workspaces. And then we can dig into each and every one of those and actually um, build them out, analyze them, etc. cetera. Uh, for creating a workspace, it's simple as clicking on the, the tab here to open up a new one. And one of the, the key components of that workspace, and we'll explore this in a bit further detail, is which scope it is associated to. Okay. So we've got the ability to create a workspace that's just targeted at that lease scope, just that core banking app. But we do have the ability to apply policy at other points in the, the scope tree. Uh, so the, the interesting part of that is this is where we can start to have application-specific policies and then maybe have other points of policy introduction that might cover uh, other business requirements. Maybe a set of policies that applies to all banking applications. So maybe there's some regulatory requirements perhaps that applies that we just want to make sure that 
are adhered to by every application, even if it's a separate application teams that might be responsible for their specific components, we might al always want to have some overriding policy in there. Ah, so you're saying I keep the application specific policies with the application scope? Yep. But if I need to create more generic policies, those that might apply to multiple applications or even across the entire data center, yep. I create a workspace that is associated with a scope that's higher in the scope tree. Exactly. And the benefit of that is you don't have to then replicate those same policies in each and every application space. It's defined uh -huh. once um, at the higher level and then it flows through to the underlying applications. Oh, okay. So you're talking about policies that I might have repeated over and over, like yep. accessing DNS servers or accessing Active Directory. Yep. Those kind of policies I don't have to repeat on an application by application basis if I do this? That's exactly right, Tim. And if you look at the, the layers that we've got, again, coming back to the, the tree there, we've got the app, the set of, let's say in this case, the banking applications, then you go even higher. You might want to have some global policies like we have here, that just are adhered to for everybody. And these would be really where you'd have those common services or the, the things that um, we just want to set once and have all applications adhere to. Okay. The other aspect of this, um, as we've discussed previously, is also that each layer in the tree also has a different set of role-based access control. So you could have different owners for different sets of policy. Um, and obviously there's a, a prioritization of those policies to make sure that those rules get adhered to. Okay, so I could give the application owner for the core banking application access to this workspace, yep. but I might be able to restrict what they can do in the global policies. I don't want them messing around with those. Exactly, yeah. So we, we want to have that higher level control of those that apply to, to all. Okay. Okay. So maybe let's, uh, let's dig into an actual workspace itself. Let's go for it. So let's start um, with the core banking app because that's where we've got our, our workloads that are running and um, this is where we actually have the ability to lay out the policy or to, to actually go through the discovery of the policy that um, makes up this application. Okay. Now, the interesting thing about here is that that policy is already existing in this case, right? Yes. So um, subsequent modules will actually run through the discovery of the, the policy and how we actually reach this. But for the purposes of walking through the workspace and understanding the components, we're starting with one that, that already exists. Yep. Because there's, there's things I'm interested to learn about. There's a, there's a lot here for me to initially take stock of. So yep. I'm looking forward to you walking through what each one of these different pieces mean. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. So the the, uh, maybe we'll start with a, a more graphical overview of what this application actually looks like. Um, that is a way just to, uh, I guess, give the, the high level visualization that's really understandable for um, each of the, I guess, the parties that's taking a look and trying to understand what is this policy, how is it made up, how does it work. Okay, so if I'm the application owner and I don't really know a huge amount about networking, ports, protocols, IPs, but I still want to get a quick visualization. This is where I'm going to go to. Yeah, so the app view allows us to really just get a, a simplified model, right? Okay. So we, we have the other components and we'll step into those next in terms of how we'll, the, the different um, building blocks that actually make this up. But the, the point here is that we actually have a, a way to, to very simply see how we've got different groups that are actually communicating together to, uh, that make up this application. We've got the, the lines or the arrows that connect them together. They're the services or the policies that actually make up the uh, overall um, policy itself. And then we've got a different set of ways that we can uh, explore this. And there's a lot of, um, it, the workspace effectively provides you the tool set to be able to step through that from the very first build out or the, the analysis of the application all the way through to that um, enforcement and the alerting configuration beyond that. Okay, so it's a very powerful toolbox, lots of things that I can play with. Um, explain me a little bit more about what this line is showing them between the two here. So, so what we're, we're essentially doing and the sort of step one in the discovery of the policy is to actually create the, the groups. Now, making up this application, we've got 10 workloads. So the, the, for this particular um, workplace, 10 workloads have been analyzed to create uh, the subgroups 
we call those clusters, and we'll, we'll step into this tab in a moment to see what clusters we've actually got defined. These um, groups here are effectively the clusters or potentially other scopes if they're external dependencies that are making up the application. Okay, so this is my banking application talking to an external dependency key value store. Yep, and you can actually see if you click on any of the objects in here, you get the breakdown on the right hand side here. So oh. it'll tell you um, what that is. It's a filter. It's um, got a specific query against a scope. So this, in this case, it is an external dependency um, based in the services, so the shared services space for us. Okay. Yep. And so each one of these groups, I see this one only has one workload. For example, is the banking web, what happens if I have multiple web servers underneath that? Does it represent that? It does. So in fact, when we um, do the analysis, we're looking at how we actually can, can match workload behaviors together to actually create a group. Because in a lot of cases, the um, whether it's the infrastructure owners, the, even the application owners, don't necessarily have that 100% clear view of these 10 workloads, the 50 workloads, exactly what functions they provide, the actual role or the tier within the application. Okay. In a lot of cases, that's something that's best discovered. Yeah, um, sounds about normal, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and and it co also can be the case that there is an expectation or the, there is a belief that, that you know, we, we know how this this particular tier of the application is made up okay. and when you actually run the discovery you find that may or may not be 100% accurate right so we're looking at really validating uh, that information and being able to then um, have a, a confirmed group that we can then base the, the application on. Ah, okay so I can see that there's a group here banking web and the more I click into it the more I can see information about the workloads that are there. Exactly so in the banking web um, component we've actually got the three workloads and we can see uh, the individual workloads that have been picked up here as part of that policy and this is something in our case again we've we've discovered through the ADM process okay so this little circle on the screen as you can see there that's highlighted by banking web yep that's not necessarily just one workload that's actually one or more workloads it's an entire tier of the application exactly okay. the, the point here is that we, we want to um, wherever possibly be working to groups of workloads that have a common set of characteristics, common okay. set of um, communication behaviors, a common set of processes that are underlying those, and we do the analysis to make sure that we, we group them effectively. Ah, so that grouping has been performed by iteration for me automatically based on the behavior. That is correct. Okay. Yeah, and that's something that we'll break down further in the ADM or application dependency mapping okay. um, component. Sounds good. All right, so that basically is just a, a quick way to just get that visual understanding of our application. Now let's just dig yeah. a little deeper into some of the other um, parts of the user interface and the key elements the, yeah. of the workspace. No, I, I do like this visual understanding here and I can definitely see that I could share this with the application developer and help communicate or bridge our two worlds together about what I'm seeing on the network and what I'm going to enforce in policy and what they are seeing from the application side. That's right and uh, I think it gives you a, a quick way to understand the actual dependencies with a, um, a, a very direct view of what is actually happening in that okay. environment. Right? Nice. So we keep the noise level low, we want to be able to talk to the application owners about the specific components that they understand in terms that they can understand and really do that validation of of what's, uh, what exists there. So we've talked about the groups um, and we've, uh, in the course of the video series, we've talked about scopes, we've talked about filters, mm -hmm. and the other one is clusters. Okay. So a cluster is another way that we can actually group workloads within a workspace. So it's a sub grouping inside the existing workspace, inside the scope. Yeah, and this allows us to really do that, um, let's say, high level grouping to create the, the scope. And that in this case, that's 10 workloads. It could be 50, it could be 100. And um, it allows us to then do the, or I guess, perform that next level subgrouping of that uh, uh, through analysis. Now, certainly in, in some cases, that may be already very well known. Um, that can be, you can, either manually or directly create this perhaps through the actual uh, through an automated action when instantiating an application okay 
Um, and again, the, the environments that we're dealing with vary from the, you know, this fairly static world or you know, the, the existing applications that have been running for quite some time versus maybe new container applications, which I in those cases we handle in different ways because they're very different in their, their nature. Okay, but what you're saying is even if you throw the kitchen sink at titration, it's going to have the right tools to work out exactly what clusters are there and part of that application. Exactly, because that's the, really the, the hard problem to deal with is, is, okay, I know I've got 50 workloads that are making up this application. What are they doing? No, I don't know, because when you're talking micro-segmentation, you need to have that much more granular or detailed policy that's enforced to the workload. Okay. Yeah, so we want to be able to, do, again, do grouping, and the cluster is that element that, an, that, that Tetration will create it will discover when it's actually performing the ADM oh, for okay. you. So the groups on, on the screen here, you can see of the 10 workloads that, that we've analyzed, um, we've actually discovered one, two, three, four, five, six subgroups, and we call those clusters. Okay, so typically you're saying clusters are gonna be auto-generated versus the scopes and the filters that you might create yourself as the, as the user. That's right, okay. yeah. Um, so just in the same way as we saw earlier, we can break down each one of these to understand what workloads were discovered, what's part of that, and we can also see the query or Tetration can suggest queries to you for dynamic ways to actually match those workloads. Uh, so I can see the query there is based on a tag being the tier. Exactly. Versus the IP address. Yeah, so it could well be at first pass, you know, maybe it's just these three IP addresses. But that doesn't necessarily lead to a dynamic outcome. It's a more static mapping. And we want the, the way to be able to build the, each of the groups in Tetration in a way that allows change. We want to perhaps be able to scale out this application tier by adding new machines. Um. The best way to do that is not by having to go back and adjust the policy by adding more IP addresses into the group but to be able to tag it or annotate it, to be able to match to some other attribute that is dynamically going to um, populate this group when that uh, action occurs. Uh, so that fits in with some of the other modules that we've looked at, like the uh, orchestrators, where we've been able to connect to systems like vCenter or Kubernetes that can provide us these uh, tags, which the uh, cluster is now using those tags to define the policy. Exactly, and so when Tetration performs the discovery, it will actually look at all of the, the information that it has, everything from host names to operating systems to the tags and uh, the things it brings in through the orchestrators to identify if I've discovered there's th you know, three machines that are performing a particular function, what attributes are common across those so that it can then create the query for you or suggest the query that you can then say, yeah, that's the appropriate okay. one for me. Okay, so we've got a, a number of clusters in this particular application. You can see that they're all dynamic, which means they're based on a, particularly, a particular query that's associated with it, like we just saw. And the other thing is there's an approval. Um, now, the approval is uh, really a, a key element here because it allows um, when you're having the, I guess, the, the review and the discussion around these groupings, a, val a way to validate those and say, if we've actually performed the discovery and we've defined a query against it, we want to effectively approve that and lock it in so we're not change it doesn't change over time. Okay, so that's literally at the thumbs up there. And that's where you as the end user, whether you are a part of the security team or if you're the application developer or a combination of the both, you've walked through that cluster and you've looked at the results. You said, I like the query, I like the workloads of the group together. Let's lock that in and continue to use that. Yes, absolutely. And you'll see this similar um, approval component in, in different elements as we go through here because once you have actually, you know, as you go through this process, um, you want to be able to lock in the things that are the known good, the things that you want to retain and not have them change over time. Okay, so yeah. when I do that, I'm feeding that information actually back into Tetration and it won't override that or change that. It's actually going to update it's, the machine It's learning. effectively saying a human has gone in and approved the, okay. what, this particular good function, whether it's a grouping or a policy entry, or whatever it might be. So one day the machines might take over, but at least for now I can have some control. That's right, that's <laughs> right. And we'll take it while, while it's there. 
So that's the, the groups, the clusters, um, and we saw those in the, the visual analysis. Now, in that diagram, we also saw the arrows that connected the different groups together. Okay. Now, what they are is the policies. Now, for each application, and again, where we've run the dependency mapping, Tetration provides the groups and the policies that connect those together. And you'll see that in this particular um, view here. Now, the policies can be viewed in different ways. Again, um, whether you, you know, prefer just a table type view or a graphical view to be able to really dig deeper and, and understand, right? So, one of the key attributes to this, or sort of um, certainly something to, to note, is the actions. So, let's just take a look at maybe one of, one of these rules. Uh, the top rule here says we are going to allow the consumer the banking app to talk to a provider called Message Queue. Okay, and you mentioned consumer and provider. Quickly, tell me a little bit more about consumer and provider because I've heard that term before. I've also heard client, server. Is it the same kind of thing? It's, it's same kind of thing. It's really based on promise theory. There's a, I, I guess, a more academic background to how these terms came about. But it is basically a, a promise that a service is going to be provided. In this case, a TCP port is uh, available to be consumed by this, um, this object. This okay, case. so it's a directional policy. It is absolutely directional. And it, and, um, it, it does not, in, in that nature, allow for the reverse to take place. In terms of, oh, okay. particularly when we're talking about directional protocols, that um, you know, we want to make sure only happen in, in that direction. Okay, so we can consider each one of these lines as a s stateful policy in that way. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Excellent. So, consumer is able to uh, consume a service from the provider, and in this case, it's a TCP service. Now, what we can see here uh, are a set of allow rules where each one of these rules has one or more services available. And you can see that over on the right-hand side here. Um, and there's a catch-all of deny. So what, what does that tell us about this policy, Tim? So I'm going to imagine that means there's a deny any any at the bottom of this policy. And anything that doesn't match one of these specific allows is going to be denied by the catch-all, is that right? Correct, and, and what this is effectively making up is a whitelist policy. Okay. So um, there's, there's different um, policy options that we have here, and what we're trying to do is to be able to discover or to define the explicit set of services that are required to actually run this application. The point here is that we want to have um, a very secure outcome in terms of the policy that we're going to enforce and we need to make sure that in doing so, we're not going to disrupt or break the application in, in doing that. Okay, so let's say I'm just dipping my toes into the water mm -hmm. and I'm not quite fully ready to go to a, a whitelist. Can I change that catch-all to another statement? Maybe permit any any? <laughs> <laughs> yes, you can. It's, it's, it's a binary choice. It's okay. permit or it's deny. Okay. And um, w again, this is something that we will uh, explore more deeply in subsequent modules in terms of both policy lifecycle but also ways to um, uh, enforce this policy and the options you have to do it in a, let's say, a staged approach, um, particularly to based on the, the risk, etc., applied okay. to the application. But that is an option. Um, you can, as a starting point, to flip that deny to allow, and that will allow you to actually uh, still enforce a policy, but not uh, enforce the, the catch-all of deny, which means if there was something that was missing here, it wouldn't actually impact the application. Oh, okay. So I can either have it in a whitelist mode or a blacklist mode, or potentially even greylist if I want to. That is correct, yeah. So, uh, and that's something that we'll explore um, as we look at some of the other workspaces as well, where we might want to actually deploy some specific deny rules to stop uh, you know, specific um, providers and consumers from talking to each other, that's where we might use that. Okay. So, so you end up combining allows and denies um, using that across the hierarchy with a prioritization to give you an overall uh, outcome. Okay. Yep. 
but within the application, really this is the, the, the goal that we're shooting for. Micro segmentation with a whitelist approach that we've actually stepped through the discovery and the validation and the analysis of that to reach a point that we are very confident and comfortable with this whitelist so that we can enforce it. Okay. And to be completely clear, this whitelist, the set of policies yep. that you have your mouse hovered over, you didn't write those in yourself. No, so these were discovered by Tetration, and in fact, um, as we step down onto the right-hand side here, again, to see a little bit further detail, you can actually see that Tetration has discovered it and has provided a confidence rating for us. So um, the confidence rating is based on the actual flows, the underlying flows that were seen during the period of the analysis. And one of the, the next things we'll, we'll step into from here is how we can start to uh, understand why were these flows even generated, right? So there's other elements in the, the user interface that uh, give us just that next level of w why is this here? Let's justify it. Let's look at the uh, conversations, the flows that made that up. So if I'm doing the first visual ana analysis of this policy, yep. I can look at that if I'm scratching my head and it's going to help me understand a bit more information about why titration created that policy. Yeah, because in most cases there will be some, there will certainly be things that are expected in a lot of cases, there are services, there are policy entries, maybe that are unexpected. Okay. And there's always the question of, eh, why, why is that? Should it be there? Let's try and work it out. So, so that allows us to really dig deeper and get the answer. Now, um, just as we, we sort of saw with the clusters as well, we've got the ability, if we've determined that this is good and this is a, um, an approved policy entry, we've got the ability to click the approval button and give that the thumbs up which then says we, um, you know, even as we progress further, this is going to be permitted and okay. it'll stay in the policy. Okay. Because I mean, a big part of this is about um, really a life cycle and making sure that over time, the policy will continue to you know, stay alive and match the nature of the application as it changes. Uh, so if I approve it, it's going to stay there and it will always be there. Yep. If I don't approve it, it's going to do what? Well, but if the actual communication continues to be active, and let's just say you know, some months down the track you, you did an, uh, another ADM to do some additional discovery, if that had gone quiet, it, it would maybe was a, just a, a seasonal, like an end of month thing or a quarterly thing that um, we actually didn't see in the new analyst, uh, analysis period, then that could, it has the potential to actually drop from the policy because we would uh, rediscover it and say, well, it's no longer there. So this allows us to retain that and keep it uh, in the policy as we move forward. Okay, that makes sense. Yep. So let's just um, uh, just kind of step through uh, a, a couple of these other components here. I think that were critical. So um, we talked to this policy view, the discovered policy, the application policy. Now, in tetration terms, that's what we call a default policy. Okay, and. Um, We've also touched on the catch-all, mm -hmm. which is uh, ultimately anything that doesn't match the, the, the um, policy in that's described here will ultimately be denied. Okay. And again, uh, again, that can be changed depending on the circumstances of what you're trying to achieve. The other component there is the absolute policy. Now, if default policy is the discovered policy, Tim, that, that we've sort of brought in through application dependency mapping as an example, what do you think the absolute policy might be? It sounds like it's a little bit more strict. Maybe it might be something that humans are enforcing, making sure that it absolutely happens maybe? Yeah, that's, that's totally right. The, the point here is that we actually have a, um, an ordered policy. There is suggested policy, which is really the default policy, and then there's the ability to have a set of overrides. And that's basically where we say, look, regardless of what actually happens or what's discovered, we just always want to make sure that this takes place. And so there is an ordering of the policy, which is also we will cover in more detail in subsequent sessions. That also applies across the hierarchy as well. So uh, absolute policies will always be, uh, I, I guess, matched to before the default policies and then ultimately the catch-alls come at the bottom. Okay, so you're saying if I put a policy in absolute, it is going to override what I see in the default policies, if there is a clash? That's correct, yeah. Okay. So 
Um, we've talked about clusters and policies. Um, the policies themselves are actually based on conversations. And now there's different ways that you can sort of get through or sort of analyze the conversations. The conversations is uh, a roll up of all of the flows that have taken place there. Um, so instead of you know there being you know 100,000 flows between this consumer and provider or these IPs with a given service, we roll that up into a conversation. Uh, so we could be communicating for a very long period of time if we're two services talking to each other. Yep. We could have hundreds of thousands of individual flows on the wire That's over right. that time. But in essence, we still just maintained one high-level conversation. That's right. And, and that is what has made up the actual policy. And you okay. can actually, um, so whilst the conversation tabs will, will give us the full list of conversations and the full breakdown, we can also get there by, you know, again, we, let's say we're just trying to get to the bottom of this particular service and say, well, what, what were the conversations that made this up? Yep. Why did it exist? We can simply say, for this service entry, Show me the conversations that were there, and here we'll actually see uh, the um, sorry the the consumers and providers in terms of the groups. We'll see the consumer and provider addresses within those groups that they actually communicated in those. Okay, in those so I can see that there is the banking app consumer on the left hand side, yep. and then the consumer address. We have two separate entities talking to that provider. Correct. Yep. So just because we have a group, and the group consists of multiple IPs, we're now sort of getting that next level of detail. Which IPs in the group were actually communicating? Who was having uh, the conversations? Okay. So it gives us that more greater level of and detail. And this could be useful if I have a, a group or a scope that's communicating to something that has lots of endpoints in it, and yep. I want to see exactly which endpoints inside that scope were communicating. Exactly. And that could be a way to start to refine the policy more. Like sometimes there will be a a larger scope and maybe there's only a small number of IPs that you're communicating to rather than have the policy entry to the large scope we create a smaller group a filter that's going to then give us a more refined policy out ah, okay so this actually really helps in the life cycle of refining policy that's right yep um, now we won't go sort of into it right now but the next level beyond this is okay we see the IPs and they're talking to each other Let's see that in more detail. Was it just a spike that occurs every 2 a.m. on a Thursday morning, or is it long sustained flows over a period of time? And the uh, titration gives you the full um, flow detail that underpins every one of these conversations. Uh -huh. And the point of sort of following this path is you can very quickly get um, to the point where you have filtered views that just take you to exactly what you're after. So by me clicking on that previous tab, it took me to something that was already filtered, already um, had the entries because I told it what I wanted to see. Okay. Yeah, so a very quick way to so I can go really get to something very specific. That high level view right down to that very, very detailed, even a per flow basis if I want to. That's, yeah. that's correct. And, okay. and all of these, yes, you can enter your own search criteria. In a lot of cases, it's the one, the one thing that you're just investigating and you can get okay. there very quickly and easily. So. We now um, have a couple of other really components to talk to. There's, there's you know, other things that probably stand out here in terms of um, what else the workspace is offering to us. One of the things that um, I'll just note up the top here is primary and secondary. So every workspace, when it's created, it can actually be a primary or a secondary, whereas secondary is more of a an experiment. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a place that we can analyze, we can check behaviors, and that is a, a policy. It's actually something that, as a secondary, we can't actually enforce. It's not um, enforceable because it's an experiment. Oh, so it's like a sandbox. Or yeah. if I want to give inter an, an intern access to the system to start playing with some policy, I can yep. give them a secondary workspace and they won't damage anything. That, that's right. Whereas a primary is really you you labeling it as the the source of truth for policy. Okay. Now by making a policy primary, it also opens up new capabilities for you as well. Okay. So these tabs over on the right hand side here, policy analysis enforcement, they only appear once we actually mark a policy as primary. And then that um, really 
it gives us, again, a new set of tools that we want to use to take the policy beyond the initial discovery into the actual point that we want to be able to truly analyze this, to enable active analysis for the policy, and then ultimately to enforce it. Okay. So if I want to get the policy analysis tab and the enforcement tab to show up, yep. I have to have the workspace in primary. That's right. Yep. And I guess primary sounds like there's only one primary workspace. <laughs> that is right. There can only be one primary. One primary for each workspace. And um, that's the, the and, and with each workspace tied to a scope, ultimately uh, each scope can only have one primary workspace. OK. Yep. So there's, there's one set of primary policies or one primary workspace for that scope, but I could have multiple secondaries. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, we, we can fl flip back to the overview tab, which we'll do in a moment, where we'll actually see um, different policy types there okay. as well, and different ways that you can view, like just the ones of interest. Like just show me the, um, the analyzed policies, just show me the enforced policies. Oh, okay. So you, you, you can get a very refined view um, across you know, what's potentially a, a large environment. Okay, I can see how that would be useful if I'm dealing with a very large scale environment. Yes. So let's step into the policy analysis page. Again, this will be the subject of another module in the series, so we won't um, go into too much detail here. But as a primary policy, this is, again, part of the, the life cycle of the, the policy. We, we want to discover it, then we want to analyze it, we want to test it make sure that it's accurate, uh, capture any um, out of policy flows so that we can work out what to do with those. Do we want to, is it something to remediate? Is it some malicious behavior? Uh, we want to make sure that the policy is, is behaving correctly. Okay, so I want to, in a sense, take the haystack away and go right down to the needle of the policies that I should be tweaking or the flows that I need to yep. care about when I'm doing policy analysis. That's right. And this view um, really gives you that view. And the other thing that's really key to this is it's also time-based. You can choose a specific point in time. You can take the current policy. You can activate that, uh, which kicks it off at a point in time. And then it'll highlight all of the flows that are within the policy, i.e. the permitted flows but also the non-compliant flows. Ah, okay. So I can go right to the ones I need to take a look at first. Exactly. You, you, you're not lost in a whole mess of you know, packet captures and stuff to try and find the things that should or shouldn't be there. Um, you can see w what occurred, when it occurred, and very specific details of th those flows that are there. So at any point in time, um, and obviously there are different ways that this you can you know, view in different um, different ways through different lenses, whether okay. it's IPs, ports, protocols. There's a whole range of things that you can actually um, sort of focus it on, depending on what you're trying okay. to do. So I can, I can slice and dice the data. Even if it's using tags, my custom tags, I can search on those? Yes, yeah. Um, okay. And that's something that we'll see. Um, for, for pretty much you know, any of the, the filters, that's probably a good thing to, to, to check in Tetration. Anywhere there's one of these question marks, you typically can hover over that and then get a list of everything that we can actually introduce as a way to filter this view. And yeah. if we scroll down, we see um, towards the bottom there, so not only the it's a lot, <laughs> the you know the flow-related information, the, the so ports and protocols, location, process, yeah. scope, um, some details about the performance of the flow. Um, yep. But down, down the bottom here, is, this is where we see oh, all right, of our tags. So, so we can see the tags that we put into the system earlier. The tags that we put into the system, so show me the flows that were between prod and dev, okay. um, as an example. Both provider and consumer side filters can be put into place here. And any combination of these things, I won't keep scrolling, uh, <laughs> it'll keep going, but, but it's very easy and, and quick to find the very specific thing that you're after. Yeah. There's a lot that I can filter on there. There is, Tim. You could, uh, <laughs> I could, be, I could get stuck all day just searching <laughs> for flows that are interesting. Well, it's, it's sometimes a trap you've got yeah. to avoid. Uh, particularly <laughs> if, if there is something of interest, um, there's uh, an immense amount of detail there. And that's actually an impo important part that you know, we are capturing all, all traffic, permitted, rejected, um, as well as sort of other sort of traffic. Again, depending on the phase of your um, 
where you are in the policy life cycle. That gives you a tremendous am amount of detail for forensic purposes as well. So if you wanted uh. to see what were those rejected flows um, last Tuesday morning at 6 a.m. and maybe w what were the permitted flows around that as well. We, we've actually got full resolution of all of those packets. We, is, we, we're, not, um, we, we're not sort of simply focusing on one particular uh, traffic type there. Okay, and, and yeah, you said last Tuesday, but I can see here like there's multiple months worth of data that you have here. That's right. Yeah. So I mean, you you can establish a very specific time query. You can um, select a time window in the in the view here that's going to take you to that very specific point in time. And in a lot of cases, again, it's not always the um, you know uh, just simply rejected flows. It, it it might be other detail that you're looking for, and we we capture, we, we retain and give you the ability to effectively roll back time to actually see what took place. Okay. And the flow data that we're seeing here, the data that we're analyzing, it's just specific to this application. I might have billions of flows across my data center, but I'm only seeing a couple of thousand here, right? Correct, yeah. So we're in the, the realms of this workspace. And the beauty of that, Tim, is that um, let's just say something, the, the application changed. There, there, was, there was some impact to the application and we wanted to investigate it. We don't need to start with everything and try and work our way down. Um, was it the banking core prod application that was impacted? Yep. Yep. Let's go straight to the, the source of truth. We know uh, all the flows, we can see exactly what we want. And we're dealing with, or we're taking that down from potentially, you know, 50 billion flow records down to, you know, at this particular point in time where there was some sort of issue, we're dealing with the uh, I don't know, let's say a thousand records that we then will further sort of filter or refine to get to the, the three uh, that were meaningful to us in a very short space. Yeah, of time. I can see that could really reduce the mean time to resolution when we have some issue. Yes, exactly. So the, the next step, we've analyzed our policy. We're, we're able to, uh, again, see the detail. We're able to analyze those potentially the rejected flows and we, we can sort of tune this to give us the view that we're after. Um, but let's just say that we've refined that policy and we're, we're ready. We know that um, you know, over the last period of time that we're comfortable with, every flow that has taken place for this application is accounted for. So we've remediated the things that shouldn't be there. We have um, refined the policy and we know that if we can enforce this micro-segmentation policy um, or the whitelist policy uh, as defined, we're not going to break this application. It's not going to be impacted. It's only going to start to secure it and ah. enter the workloads with that. So I, we'll go into more detail in the other module, but when we're looking at this graph, we're saying when it's saying 100% permitted, that means as long as the traffic stays the same, yes. this application is not going to break when I enable segmentation. Exactly. Yep. Okay, well, I've been eyeing up that enforcement tab in the top right for a while <laughs> now, so it yeah, must let's, be time to uh, get there. Let's not hold back. Let's get straight over this. So the enforcement tab, um, is where we see the the big green button here. Mm. Okay, I've been waiting to press that one. <laughs> yeah. Now there there is something else that uh, just before we we sort of actually get to to that one, uh, just something to mention. So firstly, we see currently enforcement is disabled here. Um, one of the things that often comes up is well, before I do this, what happens if something happens? Okay. Uh, that's the phone rings, you know, yep. and there's a, there's a problem to deal with. Well, there's numerous things you can do there, but we actually do um, record all of the, the actual policy lifecycle. There's an audit trail that says what's changed, when, we track the versions of, there's a full version history there. And this little um, sort of clock button over on the left side here reveals all of the previous versions to us so that we actually can compare versions and we've got a rollback function. Okay, so you're saying, if I make a mistake, which I would never do, but never. if I did make a mistake, I would have the, the capability to go back in time. Well, let's just say Remy made a mistake, and yeah, then you, it's more you likely called that Remy to fix would it, make right? a mistake. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's how how we can achieve that. Um, but the the big green button here allows us to take the policy that has been defined that we saw earlier, right? Our whitelist rules with the catch-all associated to that, um, just scoped to this particular application. I mean, a part of um, stepping into enforcement is, is scoping that. By doing it within the workspace, 
And in this case, we're down at the leaf, so we're at the, um, the actual application itself. The scope of enforcement is just for, in this case, those 10 workloads that make up this application. Oh, so I'm not switching on policy enforcement data center wide or no. titration cluster wide, it's just for this specific set of endpoints. That's correct. Now, um, we'll see in a moment um, workspaces for other points in the scope tree. As you step up in the hierarchy, you've got the ability to enforce policy at other levels. Now, if you enforce policy there, then it applies within the, I guess, the substructure of that scope. Again, it gives you uh, the, the, the policy hierarchy that we're, we're looking for. Okay. So we have the policy ready to go, and we could enforce the policies. Yep. That's right. So uh, we, we, I, actually, it's your lab, Tim. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, do. I can hit the button if you want. Yeah. But, um, so what, what they're suggesting to us is which version of policy we want to enforce. We can choose the latest policy, the one that we've adapted. Or if there are previous versions, we can choose to enforce a previous uh, edition of the policy as well. OK. Um, are we, um, for the audit trail purposes, we give some reasons, uh, an explanation for you know, fixing Remy's mistake, <laughs> and, then, uh, and then we can enforce that. And that gives us, again, the, the ability to, to see what happened and when um, should we wish to change things okay. a while back. And so you're saying it's not until this point when we click accept and enforce yep. that it would actually go and make any changes to a workload? That is correct. The, the, the dependencies there are, so for us to effectively enforce this policy on a workload, on these 10, we expect, one, that they have the enforcement capability deployed in the agent. Okay. So they, they've got the ability to control the host firewall. And two, there is a configuration, um, every agent has a configuration associated to it that has enforcement enabled in that policy. So ah. if both of those checks are in play, when this policy is enforced, we're telling it that we're able to now program the policy down. Tetration computes the policy. Again, a custom policy for each workload based on the, the combination of policy the, or the flattened policy across the, the hierarchy based on what's been configured there. And it will program that down. OK. And I guess we'll look at that in more detail in the enforcement module. We will indeed look at that in more detail okay. uh, in a subsequent module. And one other question here. Yep. There's, a, there's another graph that looks very similar to the graph in the, the previous screen. Um, Are you? Is this one looking at the enforced policies versus the analyzed policies? or? Why, why are there two very similar graphs? So, so when we actually uh, click the enforce policy button here, and it's actually a, an important task, and it's clear that we haven't done that uh, at this point, we actually insert a flag into the, um, the timeline here. So we can actually see the point in time that the policy was enforced. And, and yes, it will allow us, this is looking at the enforced policy as it differentiates from the analyzed policy, because it's possible they could actually be different versions. So uh, there is a, we talked about versioning of the policy, and which means that I may go through this process and I might enforce, let's say, policy version P5. Flag goes in, from that point I'm enforcing policy P5. Um, I might then go back, change my policy, and I might um, do analysis on the changed policy as distinct from the currently enforced policy, as, a, as almost like a staging step for then subsequently enforcing that staged policy. Oh, I see. So if I, if I make changes to the policies in the workspace, it won't actually update the rules until I click enforce again. That's right. You've, you've got ways to do further refinements and adjustments and to validate those before you come back and you say, I'm ready to enforce the next version. Oh, okay. And that's how we have the different versions that are in place there. And I can say now, um, I'm ready to enforce the latest version. Okay. So you can have this kind of cycle going on as you, as the application evolves, as you change the policy, you can live with that. Right. So I can continue to test, build, modify policy without fear of actually updating what's being Exactly. Just, just changing a line in policy doesn't suddenly um, affect it in down to the workload. Yeah, that would be useful for when I let Remy get access to the system. <laughs> if that should ever happen, right? Uh, we, we, that's what rollbacks to access is for. Oh, I see. <laughs> okay. I'm glad that we have that feature. Okay, so at any point we can come back to the uh, switch application uh, up in the right-hand side. It's going to bring us back to the, the table of 
all of our workspaces where we can see, and again, I'll just re resort this um, based on the, the tree, the, the scope tree that we were looking at, we've been exploring the application policy for our core banking prod app. Okay. Now, we might also have global policies, banking group policies, which in this case allows us to define policies in different ways. Now remember, what were the two policy types that we spoke to, Tim? Default and absolute, if I remember correctly. They were default and absolute, you're right, which means that we can step into, let's say, global policies and see that in this case, there are zero default policies. We're not running ADM at, on a global layer. We typically yeah. do that at the application layer. I mean, that, that makes sense to me, right? ADM has application discovery. Uh, this is not specific application policies. This is global policy. So I, I wouldn't expect to be running ADM here. No, no, uh, that's, that's right. But we do have absolute policies. Okay. So absolute policies allows us to write those absolute human defined rules that in this case we want to apply across the scope tree or the scope tree from the the point the, the scope that it's associated to downwards so global we're doing it at the inside layer which is basically everything like organization wide everything that is in our world we want to have this set of policies defined okay so you're saying these rules like allow access to DNS allow access to titration that's going to apply not just to that core banking application, but to every application. That's right. Yeah, and this is a common way of whether it's common services that you want to expose. Um, it could also be just general, um, everything from like business policy to regulatory policy. These things must never be, these rules must never be broken. So uh, nobody, let's just say, as we're, we're talking about a, a distributed firewall function with distributed control, um, we, we don't want an application team to be able to uh, do something that's outside of what our InfoSec team perhaps requires uh, as part of the service consumption or delivery. So you're laying down the rules of the land and then that provides a sandbox to the application teams who can continue to modify their own yep. policy but it still controls what they are allowed to do ultimately. That's right and these rules here can also be a combination of the allow and the deny rules. So we, uh. we might, this is where we might want to introduce some some blacklist rules or grey list effectively by combining those things um, that uh, again ensure that the things we want to just allow get, get that, that happens and the things that we want to always deny that is always uh, pushed down again can't be overridden. So that is interesting you have actually allow statements here so what you're doing is creating a policy that means that I can separate that from the individual application policies and because we've already permitted DNS, and I didn't see DNS in the previous screen. Yep. So this is a great point that um, by actually defining um, policy at a higher layer in the scope tree, it means that we simply don't need to expose that in the application layer itself. Now it's still going to be part of the overall policy that's actually provisioned and enforced at the workload, but. Um, it means that we're sort of reducing the, the noise level. Um, we're, without um, these rules, uh, all that certainly will be discovered and will be shown at the application level. By us drawing it up, it basically allows it to, we just sort of take that out of the view. And it gives it, again, much more relevance to the application teams who perhaps don't need to um, you know, see or necessarily care about some of the just the fundamental uh, services that actually make up the application. Okay, so when they get to see that view, it's not cluttered up with all of the centralized services that IT is running, and at the same time, yeah. the centralized services team doesn't need to know everything about every application to yeah. go ahead and apply those general services. That's right. Yep. So, so we, um, yeah, we we bring those things together, ultimately delivering the policy to the user, and again, the same set of workspace tooling is available at each of the levels based on the policies that, that are provided there. Um, in the same way, um, for the global policies to be enforced, we go into the enforcement tab and we enforce that. And by doing so, again, that will enforce that through all of the workloads that make up or within the hierarchy under that point. Okay. 
So I, I still have the policy analysis tab, I still have the enforcement tab, all the tools are there in the toolbox for me. And I, yep. I also noticed this one, you have the catch-all set to allow. Yes, um, so we will um, we'll step into that in our um, policy analysis, analysis section, yeah. and we're, uh, sorry, uh, policy ordering and hierarchy. Um, that's how we actually bring the policies together and you'll see how each of the absolute policies, the default policies, as well as the catch-alls are combined to g deliver the desired result. Okay. So I think that wraps up this session. Tim, was there any last questions you had? I feel a lot more comfortable with walking through this user interface now and Good. exactly what is going on with those default policies, those absolute policies, the, the different constructs we have available. I'm interested to learn even more about this now. Yeah, so pretty much each one of those components that we stepped into, there'll be subsequent modules we'll go into more detail and, and put it all together for you. Okay, fantastic. All right. So that concludes this module on policy workspaces. For more detail, please go to cisco.com slash go slash tetration. Thank you.